So, Piero, I guess I was wondering if you or someone else can just uh, hit, hit the space bar <laughs> as we go. Unfortunately, yeah, the clicker's not working. Turn it off. Turn it off. Oh, maybe it is. If someone, <laughs> I just need a uh, slide of answer. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm sweating my heart. So, uh, all right. Well, thanks very much, uh, Piero, for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, so, um, what I'm hoping to convey to you today is a little bit about uh, the state of the art in neuroscience. Uh, a little bit of a whirlwind, whirlwind tour of the brain and things that we do know and. Uh, Along the way, what I hope to convey uh, mostly is just how vastly mysterious all of this is to us right now. Uh, and uh, I think we all have, as a field, we need to have a great deal of humility as we go into this because we're facing uh, a system of just awesome complexity. Uh, and so, uh, so at the same time, I, I uh, hope uh, not to leave you feeling hopeless, but also tell you about some of the concrete discoveries that are now emerging, which are very exciting, which makes everybody so excited about neuroscience. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, great. So, um, so this is yeah. So, uh, so this. Oh, uh, actually, just back. Back one. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. This is great. Uh, so, so uh, this is just kind of an overview uh, of the uh, of the human human brain. What you're looking at from from the from the outside here, most of what you're seeing there is the cerebral cortex, uh, which we'll talk about um, a little more in, in a moment. But, uh, so, so one of our goals in neuroscience is to understand how the system works, how it functions, how it takes sensory input in as data, as a bunch of uh, fluctuating voltages in, in neurons, uh, and how it you know, chunk, chunks away on that and does information processing to produce behavior uh, and guide actions in the environment in a useful way. Uh, and so there's lots of reasons why we uh, want to understand this. One is, uh, from, from a scientific point of view, it's just a really interesting question. Uh, that excites us. Uh, but more practically, uh, from the point of view of medicine, uh, we'd like to be able to uh, repair the brain when it's damaged. Or, for example, uh, if you lose certain sensory modalities like vision or audition, we would like to find ways of developing neural prostheses that could tap into the structure. Right? So a lot of times in blindness, the thing that is damaged is the, is the retina, it's the eyeball. Everything in the brain is functioning perfectly well. Right? So if only you could somehow take the pixels from like, a digital camera and interface those and plug them, you know, feed them as signals into the visual cortex, which is the part of the brain that we have, um, then potentially you could see. You would have kind of an artificial vision system. Uh, same thing for audition. This is the principle of cochlear implants um, and so forth. But these, these uh, technologies at present are extremely primitive. And the reason why they don't work so well is because we don't really understand the language of neurons how neurons communicate, how, what, what format of information they expect as input, uh, and, and so forth. It's a little bit like, you know, if, if, if you unplug the keyboard from your computer, and you try to sort of, uh, if someone unplugged it, and then, uh, or you cut the cable, let's say, and you try to sort of plug it, you know, get it working again by sort of just randomly connecting the wires back in, uh, then the computer will be a little confused about, you know, what you're typing, and you have to sort of figure out how to retype things the right way. Uh, and that's kind of one of the things going on. Uh, so, so there's lots of reasons from, from the point of medical science that we'd like to um, understand how the system works, and also from the point of view of technology, because this system is a really marvelous information processor, right? It does things that computer scientists just marvel at, right? It solves NP hard problems, things that computer scientists would love to be able to do uh, in lots of different ways. Uh, and so we have no idea right now how it does it, and so it has lots to teach us uh, if we can discover the information processing principles going on there, if we have a lot to learn from it. Uh, in terms of computational principles. Okay, so next slide. Uh, so, so this is kind of the, the, the maybe three of the uh, main modalities uh, that, that people use to investigate, the scientists use to investigate the brain. Uh, so the first is uh, what a lot of neuroscientists do, uh, which is to poke inside the brain, right? To sort of open up the brain, look, see what it looks like, try to uh, tease apart the anatomical circuits, how neurons are connected together, what kinds of neurons are there, and so forth and then to, to put electrodes into neurons, record their activity, uh, hopefully record the activity of many neurons and look at how they're interacting. Okay, so that's sort of like a direct observation, looking directly inside the box. The second one here is more what psychology does. And, uh, and so we've, we've learned actually tons from this approach by just observing the brain from the outside without ever opening it up, doing nothing non-invasive 
uh, just looking at behavior, characterizing behavior. So for instance, one of, one of the, I think the grand successes of this approach was the discovery of color vision and how, how people, how, how humans uh, see color in the world. This was done actually 100 years ago, back at the turn of the previous century, uh, by Helmholtz and a number of others, where just by doing clever psychophysical experiments, by having observers look at uh, color displays uh, created with different uh, lights at different wavelengths and having subjects adjust those wavelengths of uh, the intensities on those wavelengths of light and looking at the color discrimination, you could infer that we had three different color receptors in our eye, right? They could just sort of say, it must be three. It's not four, it's not two, it's three. And moreover, they could say, and here's where they are. Here's where the peaks of the, in the wavelength sensitivities of these, of, these, of these neurons must be in the eye. And it was maybe like it wasn't until maybe 50, 50 years or more later uh, that, that people actually discovered those mechanisms uh, physiologically. Um, so, so there's lots of the people learned from that approach. And the final was the, the, the last one here is the field, that, the, the part that I work in, uh, which is uh, what's called computational neuroscience, oftentimes, but where we try to uh, collect, look at the data that, that neuroscientists are getting, uh, and look at the behavior that that psychologists are characterizing, and say, okay, well, if I had to build a brain, how would I do that, right? And how would I sort of take a bunch of neurons that we know are there, right, and have these kinds of properties? How would I take these kinds of neurons and wire them together to, pour, to perform these kinds of functions? Okay, so we're sort of extrapolating and going beyond the data and trying to fill in a story of what could be going on, and then that gives us concrete things of what we can look for in experiments, okay? So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the other approach. Okay, thanks, next, next slide. Okay, so just uh, what I'm going to tell you about here is uh, going into um, a lot about human, the human visual system, or what we're closely related to, mammalian, mammalian, uh, mammalian brains. Okay, so this is uh, you know, one of the big, big focus of, of, of study in neuroscience. But before doing that, I want to remind you that there are many other animals in, in, the, in the animal kingdom that do equally awesome things with their brains, that we just have no idea how they're doing it. And what's even more remarkable is that their brains are orders of magnitude smaller than ours. Okay, so these, I'll just go to, to, to tell you about a couple of these. Jumping spiders, you probably walked by a number of them as you walked in the building today. They're just sort of crawling all over the place. Jumping spiders, like all spiders, have eight eyes. But the jumping spiders are truly remarkable because they rely almost entirely on the visual system to hunt, to catch prey. They don't build a web like other spiders. And since the vibration, they use their visual system. They find where, they just, they just, they detect the motion of other things moving around. And these two eyes at the front, those two shiny things in the front are very large lenses that they use to form, to get high resolution vision. So they can analyze the patterns of other things in the world to discriminate and prey from potential mates and so forth and to do reading navigation. Uh, and somehow they take the information from these eight eyes and fuse them together to form some kind of a model of the world that they can behave and react to and, 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 and very intelligently. Uh, so another example is the sand wasp. Uh, the sand wasp, uh, it's his name, you know, it builds uh, its nest in the sand. It's a little burrow in the sand. And then it goes out to hunt other uh, bees. It basically uh, it hunts honeybees. And it will hunt bees as far as a mile away from its nest. So it has this nest where it lives, this little burrow in the sand. It leaves that burrow, and it will fly as far as a mile away, finds a bee, and then brings it back to its nest. Right? So, so how, somehow it uses this very low resolution system. So in contrast to the jumping spider, it only has a compound eye, very low resolution visual system. But that's enough to navigate through the environment and find its, uh, find its nest in the sand and so forth. And the, the bottom one here is the box jellyfish. This is a recent discovery of the optics in the system. So the box jellyfish, as its name connotes, uh, is a shape like a box. It has 24 eyes, right? So uh, it has to somehow take the information from these 24 eyes and bring them together. And the jellyfish doesn't even have a brain, right? It just has these amazing eyes that are connected together in a sort of ring of uh, neurons. Uh, and, uh, and so, but these, these, these two eyes featured in the bottom, they have incredibly high resolution optics. So when you bring them into the laboratory and do optics on them, optical measurements, you find that they're practically apparition free. So evolution somehow, you know, built this amazing optical apparatus for the box jellyfish. And what they think is you doing it is actually surveying the terrestrial surface around it to find good regions to hunt in the rivers. So these box jellyfish, they, they sort of, they hunt um, fish and so forth, which are, which are the banks of the Amazon River. And uh, so they want to sort of, they sort of like find these. They want to sort of go into the canopy, canopy of the trees uh, where, where these fish hang out. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so just to sort of take a guided tour of um, some things we know um, about the brain, and, uh, and this, and a lot of what we um, study in neuroscience are brains of other mammals. 
because those are the most related to uh, uh, our own. And this is uh, showing you the cerebral cortex of the macaque monkey, which is uh, subject to a lot of research in vision science. And the colored areas here, the colored regions here, are those having to do with vision. Okay, and in the macaque monkey, they constitute about 50% of the surface area of the cerebral cortex. Uh, the other thing I should mention is that uh, the cerebral cortex is basically a two-dimensional sheet of neurons. Okay, it's not like a three-dimensional volume. It's really intrinsically a two-dimensional sheet that has very low intrinsic curvature. Okay, and then this sheet is basically folded up uh, so that it you know, can fit inside your head, basically. Right? So, uh, and then what this is showing is uh, what we call an inflated brain. It's an inflated button in the computer where you digitize the anatomical slices of the brain. And you inflate it so you can see both the regions on the surface and those regions in the folds that you just can't see on the outside brain. Uh, okay, so, uh, so, this is, so these regions in, in color are those having to do with vision. This one back here, in V1, is the primary visual cortex. That's the area of the cortex that receives information from the retina or the eye via uh, the thalamus, a region Sub, uh, beneath the cortex. Okay, so uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, so, uh, next slide. Next, um, yeah, okay, so, so if we were going to take a cross section of that tissue, uh, this is what you would see. You took a cross section of that at the occipital lobe. You see this band of purple, that's where the neurons are. And, that's, and, that's the, and what you see here is that, that, that sheet of neurons is kind of folding in on itself. Okay, you're just looking at a cross section of this, of this folded sheet. Uh, and all the neurons are sitting in that purple region, which is about two millimeters thick on average. And the white regions in between them are just wire. Okay? And it's just basically axons that are connecting one of these uh, regions of that sheet to another region of the sheet. Okay? And actually constitutes the majority of the, of the volume of the brain. It's, it's actually just wire. It's not doing any, any information processing. It's just connecting you know, one, one area to the next. And so all the computation here is happening within that purple sheet where the neurons are. Okay, so if we zoom in on that region, so yeah, next slide. Uh, one more, yeah, great. Uh, so, so this is what you can see is basically, uh, unfortunately it's not really high resolution, but all those little dots there are individual neurons. Okay, this is the so-called viscous head. And you see this sort of layered structure, and there's numbers next to it, basically layer the number of the layers of the cortex. And what you find is that uh, the, the cortex has a rather canonical architecture. So all of the cortex, except for piriform cortex, which is the olfactory or cortex used for smell, uh, which is the oldest part of the cortex. Uh, that, that part of the cortex only has three layers, but all the other regions of the cortex have six layers. It has a rather uniform architecture in terms of the neurons that compose it and the way those neurons are con uh, connected along these different layers. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, one more. And so, so uh, this is just meant to uh, help you visualize the number of neurons uh, in, in the cortex there. So in that little region I showed you that was one millimeter wide, uh, and if you go another millimeter in the other region, a square millimeter from the surface and just go down from there, you would find that there's 100,000 neurons in that region of the cortex. Okay, so we just toss around these numbers in neural, in neuroscience all the time. We say, well, there's 10 of 10 neurons in the brain, the square millimeter of cortex with 100,000 neurons, and uh, it just helps me to kind of just to wrap my head around that, uh, to, to sort of visualize that into something. So this is what 100,000 looks like, right? If you look at the stadium like the Rose Bowl on a, on a full day, that's about 100,000, okay? So you want to visualize this many neurons sitting in a square millimeter of cortex, right? So square millimeter is really, really small, right? Uh, and, if you, and, and so that's, that's how many neurons are, are sitting in that, in that area. Okay, so I suggest you go back one. Okay, great. So, um, so one thing we're going to say about this is that if you, if you look about the, the amount of visual information coming into this region of the cortex, it's the equivalent of about a 14 by 14 pixel image array. Okay, so imagine, you know, you're, you're basically your, your, uh, your, uh, your retina is sending your brain on the order of the equivalent of about a million pixels total. Okay, that's, that's a one megapixel, one megapixel camera, which you may not think sounds very good, but you're always moving your, your eye around. Okay, but in any case, if you just took about a 14 by 14 pixel equivalent region of the retina, uh, this is about, and, and that, is, that basically, that's the amount of information that's coming into 100,000 neurons uh, in, in a square in a square of cortex. Okay, so the question you have to ask yourself as an engineer, and this is why we're just, you know, this is one of the huge mysteries, is why do you need this many neurons to process the equivalent of a 14 by 14 pixel array? Okay, what's really startling is like if in our field of computational neuroscience, we have no theory for that. We have zero explanation for that right now. Okay? It's just guesses maybe, but not even a concrete computational model. Okay, so this is just staggering. 
All right, so now, the next slide. Thanks. Okay, so now if you were going to take, pick one of those people out of the crowd, each one of those persons in the stadium is a neuron, right? Pick one of those people out of the crowd and ask, well, what's it doing? Okay? It's sending, you know, it's, it's basically getting inputs from a, from a bunch of other neurons. It's doing some computation on that and sending its output to a bunch of other neurons. Okay? And this is what one of those neurons looks like, a so-called pyramidal cell. And these processes you're looking at here are the dendrites of the pyramidal cell, which are getting input from the order of a, a, a thousand to ten thousand other neurons. Okay, and somehow integrated with that. Okay, another remarkable thing about this is that, uh, you know, despite the fact that we're, here we are in the year 2014, um, we've, we've known about these neurons for more than a century now, uh, there's, we still have no good computational model of what they do. Okay, and if you ask you know, how powerful is a neuron, how much, how, how much can a single neuron compute, you'll get answers that are anywhere from people saying it's something like a glorified OR gate or a glorified AND gate in a computer uh, to, you know, it's as powerful as like an Intel you know, Pentium processor or something like that, right? Uh, that we really, you know, it could be anywhere along that spectrum right now. And, and, uh, but one thing we know is that it's certainly more than, uh, than an OR gate uh, or, or just sort of summing inputs together. Uh, because the it's dendritic trees here are just loaded with uh, nonlinearities, okay, just the, the kinds of channels, the way inputs kind of aggregate here. Uh, there are these inputs are combined with linearly. So if anything, it's more like at each, in each, each little region of the dendrite, you're doing the local and of the inputs, or the local multiplication of those inputs. And then the result of all those local nonlinear operations are basically combined together. And that's what the soma is basically um, related to other neurons. Okay, so it's a potentially very powerful computational device. All right, so uh, now if we look at any one of these regions where the where input is coming on the dendritic tree, next slide, uh, we'll see that uh, if we take a cross-section of that tissue, uh, this, is, this is what we find. So, uh, so like, you know, a lot of the visualizations of the brain, you know, they'll show like neurons there, sort of interconnected with each other, and sort of cartoon visualizations, and there's a bunch of air between them. Right? There is no air in the brain, okay? So these neurons are just sort of jammed right next to each other, and they're all sort of interconnecting with each other in this three-dimensional body. Okay, and this is what you would see if you took a cross section of that volume. Uh, so uh, each one of these uh, things is you know, usually probably a cross section of an individual uh, axon or dendrite uh, that's sort of coursing through, and these are just kind of going through next to each other, not necessarily talk, not talk, probably not talking to each other. But there are places where, there, where, these, where these processes are talking to each other, and that's a uh, you know, sort of synapse up here. So if you just go to one more slide. Okay, so right, right there is what I can't picture, but with that, the lightness just came on. Where those two processes are touching, uh, that's a synapse. Okay, that's where the signals, uh, basically one, one membrane is releasing a, a neurotransmitter and it's being taken out by, uh, by the other membrane. So just one more slide. We can zoom in on what that looks like. So if we just take one of, the, one of those synapses where the two membranes come together and they're talking to each other, this is the machinery that you would see. The way these neurons uh, communicate typically is through a molecular uh, form of signaling. So one neuron releases neurotransmitter by having these vesicles, these little round things at the top, uh, fuse with the membrane and release the contents. Uh, their presence is picked up by uh, one of these receptors on the postsynaptic side, which opens a channel, it emits ions, and that in turn changes the, uh, the voltage of the cell. Okay, so there's a huge sort of com uh, complex molecular cascade. Uh, it's a kind of molecular conversation that's happening there, uh, just to signal between uh, neurons. And everything, as we study these, these synapses more, uh, we find that they're even more complicated than we thought and ever more diverse. You could have very, many different kinds of synapse, uh, synapse types in the way that they sort of uh, signal information from the neurons. Okay, so uh, next slide. So this is a kind of, uh, that, that's kind of like, you know, a scale space tour of these different uh, brain mechanisms. Uh, and uh, so just to kind of, uh, maybe, uh, it, it, if it seems hopeless now, uh, it should. Uh, <laughs> And that's okay, because that's also what makes this feel really exciting at the same time, is that these, these, these profound mysteries that, that we're up So, but at the same time, I want to sort of convince you that there are some really promising technologies now emerging. This is one of the uh, sort of impetuses for the, uh, for the Brain Initiative, which you may have heard that Obama announced uh, last, uh, last spring, and was getting everybody so excited is, is, the, is the confluence of these many new te technologies that now allow us to probe inside the brain probe at these very tiny scales and look at many signals simultaneously. And then I, that's the real hope. That's what we really need on these fields of you know, these new technologies. This is, these are just a few of them. Uh, one uh, in the upper left here is called ECOG, which is electrocorticography. And it's sort of a macroscopic way of getting signals uh, from the brain where you uh, can attach a bunch of electrodes on the surface of the cortex 
those are the right dots, and you can measure not individual neurons, but they, you know, the voltages and the currents coming from thousands to um, probably many thousands of neurons, okay, simultaneously. So this is a technique that's been, that's been used successfully by many people now, one among them, Eddie Chang, at UCSF. Uh, you've probably seen his picture on the sides of buses driving through the city, you know, the UCSF's advertising campaign where they're sort of showing off all their great doctors, and Eddie Chang is one of the people on those posters. Uh, so he's been using this econ technique to basically decode speech, to take the signals over, over the speech areas of cortex, and he can actually uh, decode uh, from this from the neurons, uh, just measured this way, uh, what you're saying, basically, uh, which is really remarkable. Silicon polytrode, so that's basically uh, a shaft of silicon with uh, 30 or more contacts along the length of the probe, and so that allows you to measure simultaneously across all the layers of the cortex. Okay, and I should mention, you know, the, the prevailing method for, for you know, at least 50 years in neuroscience for figuring out what the system is doing was based on single unit recording. You put a single microwire electrode in the cortex and you record from one neuron, right? And you listen to its action potentials in response to some behavior or sensory stimulus and then try to figure out what's going on. Which, you know, you can imagine just given everything I just told you, <laughs> it's kind of hopeless, right? Uh, but actually, remarkably, we people have learned a lot through that method, but, uh, but now, you know, we, you know, we, this is kind of where our attention is turning to, to record now. We can look at uh, an entire column of cortex across all these different layers. Sometimes. And this one down here is uh, also it's very exciting optical imaging based uh, typically on two photon or uh, calcium imaging, calcium using two photon um, imaging. So, this is basically all these little uh, white dots there are individual neurons which are lighting up when calcium enters the cell. Uh, and so calcium is basically related to, the amount of calcium that enters the cell is related to the amount of voltage, the voltage depolarization of the cell. So as these, voltage, as these cells are sitting there in the population changing their voltage, going up and down, they light up like Christmas trees, literally. So you can see these under, under, under the microscope and you can now image an entire population of cell, uh, cells there. Um, and this is showing so, so the different types of good kind of different types of different, different, how, how the population is changing across, uh, how the activity is changing across the population. So that's another very exciting. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so so uh, so the final thing I want to tell you about is uh, is, is a finding um, set of findings I'm, I'm I've gotten particularly excited about uh, recently, and uh, and uh, not just me but lots of people because they just won the, the people who discovered these things um, just won the Nobel Prize this year, uh, and so I just want to tell you about that because I think it's very very, very timely. Uh, so uh, so the three people who won the Nobel Prize this year in physiology and medicine uh, are neuroscientists. Uh, John O'Keefe on the left, who discovered uh, place cells in the hippocampus, and Liebert Moser and her husband Edvard Moser, uh, who uh, discovered so called grid cells in the, uh, in the intraoral cortex, which feeds into the hippocampus. Okay, so I just want to tell you a little bit about that. And how much time do we have? We have like, uh, it's like 20 minutes. Okay, great. Right. Okay, thanks. thanks. Okay. okay, so next slide. And thanks for doing this slide. Okay. Uh, so, um, so, so just to sort of orient you about, it, about that, I'm going to go back to this picture of the macaque monkey uh, uh, cortex. Again, these, 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 these colored areas are all the ones that have to do with vision. And so there's a lot of neuroanatomy that's been done on this system to tell how these different areas are interconnected to each other. Okay, next slide. Uh, and so uh, this is what this is a uh, diagram, very famous diagram of this in the field that was um, done by Van Essen and Fellman about 20 years ago. And each of these colored boxes here denotes one of those colored areas you saw in the previous slide, okay, in the surface of the cortex. And the lines between them indicate that there's a connection between those, those, those two areas. Okay, so the macaque monkey, there are, on the, are, there are about 30 different visual areas. They're not all fully connected to each other. Uh, it's not all about less than one third um, connect, con, um, interconnectivity. Okay, and so the important thing to sort of get from this diagram is that these different areas are arranged in a, in a hierarchy. Okay, and so they're basically their level within this diagram indicates how far removed they are from direct sensory input. So these ones at the bottom are basically the most direct. So this is the retina, this is the thalamus, and this is this area of V1 that so we talked about before. Right? So V1 is the first visual area of the cortex getting input uh, from, from the retina. And then V1 in turn sends its, uh, uh, its output to V2, which in turn sends its output to all these other visual areas and they sort of climb up. Lab. Okay, so each time you go up a box, you're going basically, you're, remo you're moving yourself about a couple of synapses directly from, uh, from the drug sensor. So these areas at the top of the diagram are way deep inside the brain, right? That's sort of like your sort of more access and your inner model of the world, right? And they're very far removed from drug sensor input, and they're sort of trying to form some uh, representation of the world and how you act and so forth. Um, and 
but not directly related to sensors and not directly related to uh, well, not directly related to the motor system or muscles and so forth. Okay, and at the right, I sort of put indications of what people think is being represented there. So uh, at the right, it says the board filters. That basically just means a set of oriented filters are basically uh, local visual extracting local visual features from the image. Okay, and so that's been very well intensively studied, and people trying to characterize what that's uh, been doing. We can. We can relate those kinds of transforms we see in V1 to uh, engineering principles, uh, the way people uh, you know, process and represent images uh, and technology and so forth. Uh, and, and the dot, dot, dots as we go up, right, and that question mark means that basically we haven't a clue of what these other areas are. I mean, they're just like huge black boxes. We have just a vague idea they're doing something more complicated than just image features. Uh, but what exactly, we, uh, we really don't know. And then you finally get these uh, set of green boxes up there at the, at the right. Uh, those, those neurons are basically uh, related information about objects. Uh, and one of the, and there's one uh, set of areas which are specialized for bases. So if you put your electrode into those, into those neurons, you'll find that those neurons only fire when you're looking at the face. Uh, and they fire for different properties of the face. Uh, and so forth. And so they're, they're basically face selected cells and they've been very intensively studied. And if you go even higher up in this diagram, you see this box called ER at the top. That's the entorhinal cortex. And the one just above it, HC, that's, that stands for the hippocampus. Okay, so the hippocampus, um, what was this diagram to know? It's kind of like the top box in the system, right? The hippocampus is a very special area because it's involved in episodic memory. It's basically a region that's crucial to, to taking everything that you're experiencing now, let's say about this room, where you're sitting, uh, and you know, what the room looks like around you, uh, what I'm saying, you know, and so forth. This episode right now is taking all this information and binding it together into one, you know, one unified representation of this experience. Okay, and your ability tomorrow, when you, you know, tomorrow you sort of look back and think back and say, what was I doing yesterday about this time in the afternoon? Your ability to do that and recall all the stuff that you're experiencing right now is due to the hippocampus. Okay, if you don't have a hippocampus, you can't do that. Okay, you're basically just living in a short-term. You know, experience from day to day, and you can't sort of find together and, and, and sort of assimilate um, these episodic experiences. Okay, so as we know, that's been very well established. Somehow the hippocampus is doing this appropriately, then it's very high up in the top box of the system. It's not just getting visual input, it's getting input from the somatosensory system, from touch, from smell, from hearing, and all this stuff is sort of coming together uh, and, and, and uh, converging and binding in that area. Okay, so a, a very salient property of these neurons in the hippocampus um, in, in, in rats is that they have these things called place cells. Okay, so next slide. And so place cells are basically neurons that encode where you are in space. Okay, so each one of these uh, boxes here denotes the place cell of a, of a different neuron in the cortex. Okay, uh, and so that red, the, where, where it's red, that says that the neuron is firing uh, when, when the animal is there. When, the, when it's blue, that means that the neuron is not firing. Okay, so each box is the place field of an individual neuron. So what we're looking here is the, the place fields of a population of neurons uh, in response to the rat being in different parts of the room. Okay? And so as you can see, each of these neurons basically takes responsibility for a different part of space. Okay? So when the rat is over here, uh, then you know, one particular neuron is firing. And when the rat is over there in that part of the room, then a different neuron is firing. This neuron is no longer firing. Okay? So as the rat moves around the room, you can see these neurons just kind of light up on the and they're basically encoding where the rat is in space. Okay, it's basically like a map. And people oftentimes refer to it as a cognitive map that's sitting there on the rat's brain. Okay, it's not just rats that have these. Monkeys have them, and humans have them. We have them too, right? So, uh, so, so right now, you know, based on where you're sitting in this room, there's one population of neurons firing, and if you moved over there, then a different set of place cells would be firing inside your brain. Okay, and so this was discovered by John O'Keefe back in the 1970s, and it's the then it's, uh, the subject of huge amount of investigation, as you can imagine, very intriguing properties. The ones that are sort of read all over the place, within the box, those are probably inhibitory neurons. Their neurons are just sort of firing anywhere, and they're basically inhibiting other neurons and trying to keep them silent, prevent them from firing, so the other neurons can be more selective. Okay, so this is place cells. So now let's go one, one, um, one area upstream from that, so basically the, the area of the cortex that's feeding into the hippocampus, that's called the interrhinal cortex. Okay, next slide. And this is what you find there, from the interrhinal cortex, this is the, uh, uh, how a single neuron, this is, before I go previous slide, I showed you a population of neurons. This is the response field of a single neuron in the entorhinal cortex as the rat moves around space. 
Okay, so each where each place where there's a dot here, that means that they're on fire. And all these sort of gray lines here, that's just the rat's trajectory. So the rat is kind of wandering around this room, and as the rat wanders around the room, you're monitoring where this cell is firing uh, within the room. And every time it fires, you just put a dot down in that part of the room where it fire. Okay, so this is what uh, the Mosers discovered about 10 years ago, in 2005. And this was just completely mind-blowing to everybody. Right? Because, first of all, in juxtaposition to a place cell, which only fires in one place in the room, these response fields are multimodal, they're firing in multiple places in the room. Moreover, if you look at how those different modes are laid out, they're laid out in a hexagonal grid. This is just truly amazing, right? These, this is an area of the brain that's way high up, like I told you, right? It's not like right it's down the retina, it's way, way inside, deep inside your brain. You have these neurons, and you, you, each one of you has these, right? As you move around the room, the, these neurons are basically firing according to a hexagonal grid, okay? And encoding, uh, trying to encode where you are in space. But if, obviously, if you just looked at one of these neurons, you would have no idea where you are, right? Because if the neuron fired, you could be here, there, 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 and there, right? So this basically, this, this set of neurons forms a distributed code. There'll be a, another neuron there that has its grids, you know, its, it's modes there in a different location. And by looking at the whole population, you can, you can tell um, where you are. So it's these neurons that are feeding into uh, the, uh, the hippocampus, okay? And so, you know, why these are there? Why, why, why do we have, why, you know, the brain has decided to code space this way? No one has a clue. Uh, but it's truly fascinating. Uh, it's mathematically very interesting because it's using, you know, something that, you know, sort of mathematically makes sense, that, you know, which I'll mention in a bit, if you want to talk space. So next slide. So, so now it really gets interesting uh, when you, yeah, so next slide. Um, uh, when you uh, look at um, when you look at uh, how multiple, many of these neurons, oh yeah, I'm just back on it. Yeah, yeah, the computer is slow. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's just thinking about it. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so this is the, this this is the grid cell, uh, the grid the grid, um, the grid map of one particular cell. And as you advance through the entorhinal cortex, and that's just showing it up there at the top, a cross section of the entorhinal cortex, and they're moving here tangentially with their electrode. They're taking their electrode and moving it tangentially to the surface of the cortex. And as they traverse the cortex in that direction, what they find is that the grids get further and further apart. Okay, so you'll see this is the next, you know, as they go further along in the tangential direction, uh, they, they space further apart, and then even further apart, and even, even more and more Okay, so the scale is basically changing as you go from one end to the other along this grid. What, you're, what they're showing down here is the autocorrelation uh, function of this map up here. So here you can see this hexagonal uh, spacing extremely um, vividly. Okay, uh, next slide. So, so, the, uh, so now where it gets really uh, amazing, really interesting, is, is that this, uh, this grid space is discrete. It doesn't just change along a continuum, right? So as you march along the, the cortex there, it's not like they're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger in a continuous fashion. They said they're going in jumps, right? So you'll be going along here, you'll be at one scale, and all of a sudden, it just jumps in the scale. Right? You can see that here as well. This one here is bouncing back and forth, but it's going in these discrete jumps. You can see that also very clearly, this plot at the top, which is making a histogram, and you can see this multimodal distribution. It's not a continuous distribution of scales, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a multimodal distribution, meaning there's a kind of dis dis discretization of, of the spacing uh, among these neurons, okay? So that was discovered just actually about two years ago uh, by the Mosers, okay? And so that's uh, space, and then uh, one more uh, slide. Um, the, uh, uh, so the spacing is not, it's not just the spacing is discrete, but also orientation. So these grids, each of these cells, grids, has a certain orientation to it. And if you look among the population, the orientations are not just continuous, they're not just changing by the continuum, they're changing in discrete steps as well. And again, you can see that from this multimodal histogram here. Okay? There's sort of these gaps in between, and there's places where you find cells tuned towards a particular orientation of the grid, and then um, and no cells, and then a bunch of cells put another orientation. Okay, and then next slide. Uh, and so, but then, what else we found is that these, uh, the grid spacing and the orientation are changing together. Okay, so, so when the grid spacing changes, the orientation also changes and vice versa. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so, so, so why is it doing this, and, and what's the reason for this particular um, um, uh, spacing, you know, this sort of discrete strategy? So there's some really nice theoretical work on this recently that I got really excited about, and I'm starting to think about now. But 
this is due to a, a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania named Susan Wei. And uh, so what he's been uh, basically doing is trying to uh, show that this, this, this uh, coding strategy is actually op optimal okay, uh, for, for coding visual space. So one way of looking at it, uh, so those colored stripes up there sort of indicate where the neuron is firing. So for scale one, the neuron is firing over the red zone and it's silent over the blue zone. Okay, and at scale two, the neuron is firing again in the red zone, but now in two different locations, and at scale three in those four different locations. Uh, and uh, so, so I'll just cut the chase here to the next slide. And so if you look at the, 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 uh, the scale factor between these, uh, between these uh, different grids that you find there, uh, you, you could ask, well, what's, you know, is, uh, when the spacing changes, by what scale factors it change, right? And it turns out it's one constant scale factor that changes by. And it's not two, it's not three. Uh, it turns out that it's this number somewhere between 1.44 and 1.4 and 1.6. Okay? And, uh, and if you work this out in one dimension, it turns out if you had an animal moving just in one dimension, the optimal, optimal spacing would be this ratio, the optimal ratio would be this um, magic number E. It turns out, and uh, in two dimensions, it turns out that the optimal ratio is the square root of it. And, uh, and so the, the really interesting now fact is that if you look among the population, they look at those populations in the most, uh, and those neurons in the most of the data, uh, the, the ratio you see in biology is actually right, right in there, okay, unbelievably. Okay, so just as the theory predicts, uh, the square root of E ratio is actually showing up among these populations. Okay, so uh, the, the exciting thing here, I think, is that you, you have this, uh, you know, you have this very sort of mathematically interesting looking object way up, way up high there in the brain. It seems to be um, obeying these mathematical principles. And so, uh, you know, I think there's kind of a, you know, one of the zeitgeists in, in, in biology is that uh, the brain is just a mess. And in fact, uh, Francis Crick once said that God is a hacker. Uh, and so that would sort of, sort of say that you should, be, you know, if you looked inside the brain, it's just going to be a mess. And indeed, you know, most of the time it does look pretty messy. And, but sometimes it looks extremely elegant uh, and uh, mathematically precise and sensitive. And this is one of those places. Uh, and uh, there's many others, but this is, you know, I think one of the many that are coming out there. Okay, so I'm happy to open it for questions.